you see the presentation now? Yes. All right. And now do you Perfect. see the Yep. Now right. now you have it presenting. Perfect. Great. So we are right at 215. So I will go ahead and introduce our next speakers. Um, Ron Sun and John Mekic. I hope I got your name close at least. Um, yeah, go ahead and um, start your presentation. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm John Mekic. I'm a PhD student in Ron Sun's Cognitive Architecture Lab at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And it's my pleasure today to present our work on Clarion and Raven's matrices on the behalf of the two of us. So for those of you who are not familiar with Clarion, uh, Clarion is a psychologically oriented cognitive architecture. Um, it's a connection of symbolic hybrid architecture. It exhibits a dual representational structure, addresses a variety of cognitive uh, and motivational phenomena, and it consists of multiple distinct interdependent and complementary subsystems like other cognitive architectures. So a key idea in Clarion is the distinction between implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge. Uh, implicit knowledge is simply tacit knowledge. Uh, it's generally associated with the following observations. Uh, on the one hand, we have subjects who are unable to verbally report certain past knowledge, but when uh, we put them under certain situations, like we ask them to do a forced choice, they exhibit past knowledge. So Clar in Clarion, uh, the distinction between expli and explicit knowledge, on the other hand, is knowledge that people can verbalize, generally speaking. So uh, this distinction motivates in Clarion the dual representational architecture, where a top level encodes explicit knowledge and the bottom level encodes implicit knowledge. And these two levels interact um, in various ways, and they may encode knowledge in a redundant fashion. Now, the interesting thing about this interaction is that it can capture various effects, uh, including several synergy effects and uh, some effects that are relevant to Raven's matrices, such as verbalization effects and the effects of performance pressure. Additionally, Clarion has dedicated mechanisms uh, for motivation. Um, on the explicit side of things, we have goals. And on the implicit side, we have drives. Basically, the way this works is uh, implicit drives sort of uh, differentially activate different goals. So if your hunger drive is strongly activated, then you may be more likely to set a goal to search for food or something. Finally, uh, in order to coordinate uh, all of the different component processes, uh, we have various metacognitive monitoring and regulation processes. These typically set parameters or goals. So as an overview, you can think of Clarion as a network of neural networks, uh, which includes four subsystems. The action-centered subsystem uh, which encodes procedural knowledge, the non-action-centered subsystem, uh, which encodes declarative knowledge, generally speaking, the motivational subsystem, and the metacognitive subsystem. In each of these uh, subsystems, there are chunk nodes at the top level, um, and there are rules that link these chunk nodes to each other. And in the bottom level, we have feature or micro-feature nodes uh, which are essentially the inputs or outputs of implicit networks, and that's in the bottom level. Chunk nodes uh, encode uh, their localist representations. Uh, they essentially encode individual concepts, and uh, feature nodes uh, constitute various distributed representations, so concepts are encoded by some combination of features. Uh, therefore, chunk nodes are used to support rule-based reasoning and feature nodes support implicit reasoning and similarity-based reasoning, as we'll see. So uh, 
important point here is that chunk nodes and feature nodes are linked. And when in Clarion we talk about a chunk, what we really mean is a chunk node together with its links to various feature nodes. This linkage allows activations to flow in a bottom-up fashion, so from features to chunks, but also in a top-down fashion, from chunks back to features. And this activation flow is the main way in which the two levels interact. Uh, an important consequence of the dual representational architecture is uh, the ability to capture similarity-based reasoning. So the way this works in Clarion is that a chunk node, let's say A, uh, gets activated. And uh, top-down flows from this chunk activate its features, uh, including features that may be shared with some chunk node B. And then these uh, shared features then partially activate B or totally activate B, depending on what features are included in B, in a bottom-up fashion. And so the end result is that the activation of B due to uh, chunk A is essentially the product of the activation of chunk A with the similarity from A to B as given by the equation on the slide. So we're using Clarion to uh, model human performances, performance on Raven's matrices. Uh, this is a psychometric test that's used to measure fluid intelligence typically, and it involves solving matrix problems, which are these uh, which have the general format that you see in this figure. So on the top here, you have the matrix proper with a missing bottom uh, right-hand corner. And then you have a set of alternatives and you have to pick the alternative that best completes the matrix essentially. Uh, we're working with a specific variant of this general format called Sandia Generates Matrices. So, Matrices come in different sort of styles. Uh, Sandia matrices has two major types. On the left-hand side, you see uh, an instance of a sort of medium difficulty object transformation problem. And on the right-hand side is a more difficult problem uh, uh, of, of a type known as logic, log, uh, well, they're dubbed logic problems. So why look into Raven's matrices with Clarion? Uh, it's because we think that the dual representational architecture uh, can offer an integrated and parsimonious way to capture uh, both uh, cognitive processes involved in the task as well as some important effects. In particular, uh, what we're interested in doing is capturing the analogical aspects of the task uh, as a special case of similarity-based reasoning. And uh, we also want to use the interaction of the two levels to account for various phenomena, such as verbal overshadowing uh, and tilting under pressure, which I'll talk about more later. So we aim to capture the role of implicit versus explicit processes, and also address uh, various cognitive aspects that have appeared in previous models and break new ground by uh, looking more deeply into motivational processes and effects. So the basic idea behind the model is that by combining implicit and explicit processing, we can solve matrix problems. And more specifically, the way it works is that basic perception, which is accomplished by some visual module, uh, is directed by the ACS. Uh, on the other hand, visual relations are detected uh, by implicit processes in the NACS, the non-action sensor subsystem. But this detection process itself is detected by, uh, directed by the ACS, the action sensor subsystem. Um, as a consequence, response selection is primarily driven by similarity-based reasoning in the non-action sensor subsystem. And motivation comes into play at various points by uh, changing the amount and explicitness of processing based on drive activations in the motivational subsystem. So I'm going to quickly go over two preliminary models and then talk in a little bit more detail about the final model that we're working on in Clarion. Uh, our first model uh, was really a first pass attempt at uh, doing Sandia matrices uh, in this general framework. 
it addressed only a subset of uh, Sandium HSDs, but it did have this uh, dual architecture of using uh, some kind of implicit neural network to detect relational features, and then uh, selecting responses based on the similarity uh, that can be computed on those implicit representations. Our next model uh, generalized the previous model and simplified it. Uh, the solution algorithm was a lot simpler in particular. Uh, and uh, there was no sort of assumption that would be restricted to a specific subset of Sandium matrices. And uh, it achieved a pretty high uh, performance rate, uh, as you can see, as compared to the human. So model three is all about bringing these ideas and really implementing them within the general framework of Clarion. And the main ideas here is to construct chunks uh, representing characteristic row and column features, and then find the best match of these chunks among the candidates using similarity-based reasoning. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, steps and sub-goals that are involved in this, and uh, we'll see some of them in action in a worked example later on. But first, let's talk a little bit about how we're doing visual processing. Uh, it's broadly inspired by feature integration theory in that we're assuming there are some basic features that are just detected in parallel uh, during a fixation, such as pose, form, and texture. Uh, and then we detect relational features uh, based on sequences of fixations that take these basic features as input. Uh, we make some simplifying assumptions. Uh, we assume that each panel is just one fixation point, and we have domain-specific uh, form and texture representations. Uh, so you can see all this in the figure on the left here. At the top, you've got the image uh, panel. Um, and then these are labels that are used to train the visual network. So here's position, this is orientation, size, shape, shading. And uh, as you can see, the symmetry of the oval is captured by two orientation nodes being activated simultaneously. So this uh, these basic perceptual representations uh, get routed to a relational network, uh, which operates in the bottom level of the non-action-centered subsystem. Uh, this means that relation detection is sequential and implicit. And the way this network works is that it takes in um, activations from the current fixation and outputs um, strengths for relational nodes. And it's able to uh, process relations of higher arity, two, three, four, whatever, uh, because there are recurrent connections um, in a secondary input that takes the previous state of the uh, relational network's output. OK, so here's the worked example. Uh, on the left here, you see the matrix. Here are the alternatives, and then um, these uh, this row and column just show the completed uh, row and column alternative uh, figure sequences. And essentially, the model proceeds by creating uh, descriptor chunks for the major axes of the matrix, so the rows and the columns. And then it evaluates the similarity of uh, alternative uh, sequences, so sequences constructed with an alternative to the major axis description. Uh, it proceeds in an incremental fashion, uh, and it considers lower arity relations first. So for instance, if you look at the um, similarity score table here, the, uh, we've evaluated the uh, change in shading feature here. Uh, we've detected a pattern with that because if you look, the shadings get progressively darker. Um, but before this was done, the model actually considers uh, just sets of shadings. So it says maybe, you know, uh, there's just three shading values that appears in a row, uh, and those three values just appear in both rows. But if you look here, that's not the case. And to the model, that appears as a conflict, which results in the model abandoning that idea and trying the higher arity 
uh, feature, which is a change of shape, where it fixates on two uh, panels in order to evaluate uh, shape cha uh, shading changes. So response selection based on these individual dimensional um, similarity values can be done by averaging or possibly also by incremental elimination. And uh, we're working on uh, on that. So if we just look at how the model processes information, um, we can already see that there are working memory and control issues that arise. Uh, basically, the main thing that the model does is create various chunks and then compare them. And uh, there are two chunk creation processes, uh, chunking basic or relational visual information, and then using those chunks to then create row or column descriptors. And here, uh, working memory issues can arise because uh, these are new chunks, and chunks uh, don't, are, don't persist indefinitely. Uh, and new chunks tend to get deleted uh, sooner rather than later due to having uh, low base level activation. Uh, to that, we can add uh, the fact that more complex problems require the creation of more chunks while else being useful. A secondary issue that relates to control uh, involves the fact that in order to create, uh, in order to detect the correct relations or chunk together um, that information correctly to create row or column descriptors, we have to do various input output filtering operations. So this general picture agrees with uh, several lines of evidence from the literature. And um, let's take a look at, a closer look at how uh, we, we can capture these phenomena of the effect of working memory capacity on performance, uh, the differential effects of control processing and working memory, et cetera, within the model. So one thing to consider is that incomplete analyses uh, can result in lower accuracy and uh, there may be any number of reasons for incomplete analyses. In particular, we, we could have working memory issues, such as uh, the deletion of chunks that I just mentioned. Uh, we can have control issues, uh, such as interference among different features. So features being activated when they shouldn't be uh, because the network forgot to filter out visual inputs when it was trying to combine row descriptions. Um, and there may also be motivational issues. So low or overly high self-efficacy may result in essentially premature responding, uh, leading to an incomplete analysis. And uh, as a result, the model may cope in various ways. One way is to do incremental structured processing. Um, another way is to periodically review and or refresh important information. And finally, uh, we can try regulating self-efficacy through, for instance, implementation assumptions. Now we come to uh, the role of explicit versus implicit processing. So feature patterns are detected uh, primarily through implicit processes, but uh, they're under explicit direction and they require explicit intervention when we're doing similarity-based evaluation. Um, so this requires a balance of explicit versus implicit processing, uh, which may be thrown off in various ways. For instance, performance anxiety uh, may implicit, uh, may impede uh, explicit, uh, that is goal-directed control by encouraging uh, overly implicit cognitive mode. And uh, verbalization, on the other hand, uh, may impede pattern detection by encouraging an overly explicit cognitive mode, preventing the bottom-up signals from actually activating the chunks to the degree that they should. Uh, there are various possible extensions to this model. Uh, one possible extension is a constructive matching solution strategy. So uh, our current strategy involves just eliminating alternatives, essentially, um, by constructing these uh, alternative sequence representations and comparing them to the rows and columns. But we could 
also creates a sort of idealized, you know, this is what the answer, answer should look like type of representation, and use that to select the alternatives, much in the same way using similarity-based reasoning, but uh, similarity-based reasoning on the alternatives instead of alternative rows and columns. Uh, we could also relax the assumptions, so uh, more generic form and texture representations in particular. Spectral representations uh, of these things might be a good way to go. And of course, uh, we could relax the fixation option. Finally, um, it may be possible to learn uh, these relations at play through various algorithms, uh, such as uh, cascade correlation. So to sum up, uh, the model seems to be converging towards a parsimonious and integrative model of various phenomena associated with gradient matrices within Clarion. Additionally, uh, we have al along the way developed uh, what's essentially a Clarion-based model of visual processing that goes from pixel inputs up to object detection. Um, and also, we've developed a novel approach to the relation detection and representation in Clarion, which relies on implicit processes. Now, to finish off on a more speculative note, um, I think it's interesting to ask, you know, what can a model like this tell us possibly about the nature of fluid intelligence more generally? And uh, my interpretation is that According to this model, fluid intelligence looks like the ability to process relations in a goal-oriented way, uh, and that this processing requires fine coordination among subsystems uh, and implicit or explicit processes. So as a result, we uh, get various factors that may determine fluid intelligence uh, within the architecture, such as relatively stable features, the modular structure of the architecture, the cross-level interaction, DLA settings for chunks, et cetera, uh, but also motivational drive structure and processes, in particular things that may be related to personality possibly. And finally, uh, cognitive or metacognitive skills. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from the chat. Okay. Is there a relation between your similarity matching mechanism and the structural matching in Ken Forbes's analogy processes? Um, th there could be, because we're computing similarities um, over relational features, right? And that, that looks a little bit like structure mapping. But to be honest, I haven't uh, drawn a sort of formal correspondence between the two, but I think I think there could be something there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now, but we can wait for some as we um, queue up the next talk, which will be in six minutes. Um, I also had a question if if you would, um, if you don't mind, yep. um, do you think the um, explicit and versus implicit balance that you talked about mm -hmm. um, could have some implications for helping people improve task performance on um, tasks besides uh, like these matrix tasks? Uh, yes, uh, there have been several simulations with Clarion that show how well, that essentially show that in certain tasks, it's better to do, it's, it's good to have explicit processing. One example of this is the Tower of, Towers of Hanoi task. Uh, but in other tasks, too much explicit processing could be detrimental. Now, I'm not, I don't know of a sort of general sort of rule of thumb saying, you know, this task uh, should be implicit, this task should be explicit. Um, but the same ideas have definitely been applied to other tasks. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like that's the last question for now. So um, I will let Laura go ahead and set up her talk. 
but we will keep the questions open for now um, for the next five minutes because we do want to start the next one at 2.45. So thank you. So I see a question here. Could you elaborate more on what you stated early on uh, regarding goals and motivation? Uh, no particular question, just curious how you frame that word. So you're talking about like the general mechanics of how goals and uh, motivations work in Clarion, I assume. Um, so basically in the motivational subsystem you have drives in the bottom level and you have a goal structure in the top level and uh, these drives may be activated uh, uh, in, in various ways depending on the situation uh, but also depending on uh, personality based factors essentially so some people may have you know more baseline curiosity uh, deficits so the, the drives work on drives work on the basis of deficits um, so a uh, high curiosity deficit would produce goals that are um, sort of geared towards resolving those deficits. And essentially what happens in the motivational subsystem is that the drive deficit, the drive activations uh, are computed and uh, sent to the metacognitive subsystem, uh, which takes them into account when uh, setting goals. Uh, and then these goals get stored in the goal structure and participate in uh, controlling the behavior of the action centers and the non-action centers. Does that answer your question? Great, we have an affirmative from Steven. Yes. So I think we have about a minute left here. Um, it looks like we're out of questions. Oh, John. John has a question. Is it possible to do multiple tasks in a single Clarion system? Um, so does the metacognitive component control which task, uh, which task is happening? Um, I I think that question means so. Um, uh, yes, um, I mean it's it's possible, uh, and the the way it would work, I think, it, so so that's sort of one of the functions of the motivational subsystem is actually to to help decide between which tasks uh, the the agent should be doing. Um, so what one of the things the motivational subsystem does uh, is, you know, it gives you inputs about what tasks you should be doing. And then the metacognitive subsystem sets goals accordingly. Um, but the goals persist, which prevents the agent from sort of randomly switching tasks, essentially. Okay, thank you. So it is